All right, so for this video, we'll cover the second half of this chapter. And in this section, we're gonna talk about how positive psych can be applied to counseling. We've already covered historical context and positive psych in general. So now we'll look at how this is being used in a counseling context. <clears throat> so there's two different ways that therapies can use positive psych and strengths-based approaches. The first is by adding it to existing theoretical approaches. And this is what we'll talk about first. So basically, let's say you're Carl Rogers, you're person-centered, and you wanna add some strength-based interventions. That's how some um, ways that this gets incorporated. Or you're psychodynamic, but you wanna add in some strength-based interventions. So we'll cover that first, and then we'll move on to therapies that have been specifically designed to be only strength-based, like they're just strength-based on themselves instead of additions. So we'll start with the ones that are you can add to any sort of theory. So as I've mentioned, um, a lot of these interventions can be added and integrated into any therapy approach. Again, that could be gestalt, it could be um, existential, it could be person-centered, psychodynamic, uh, feminist multicultural, and so on. So these strength-based interventions can be added into any different approach. One way they'll do this is through assessing the strength of the clients in various points of the, the counseling. So they'll ask people about their strengths in the intake session when they first meet with the client. Generally, the client's talking about what's going wrong, you know, what's happening in their life, what's bringing them to counseling. But a strength-based intervention may be to also ask, in what ways is the client doing well? What are the client's assets that they're bringing to their life? How adaptable is the client? Um, they might ask about social support. Um, so they'll ask these things in the intake process, and then they'll use whatever comes up, these strengths in case conceptualization. So thinking about this case, this client, they'll not only think about what's going wrong, but they'll think about, okay, how can we use these assets? How can we use these strengths in helping them get better? So this case conceptualization means how you're thinking about this client and this case and um, how to include both you know, negatives, what's going on in their life, but also maybe what they're bringing to the table. So they'll use utilize strengths throughout the therapy process. Um, they might point out strengths that the client is not aware of. So let's say the client is very anxious and is coming in because of their anxiety and um, things like this. Well, they might note how the client is very conscientious, how the client is um, perhaps cares a lot. There's a high degree of empathy and care or something like this. So they, they'll highlight the client's strengths um, as the client, as the session goes. They also can positively reframe things for the client. So let's say a client is really struggling with developing relationships. Um, the relationships, they've out, they get into a lot of breakups. Um, they um, have a lot of conflict with relationships, things like this. So this is causing real problems for the person, um, but it might al also be helpful for the client to know, you know, one of their um, strengths is, it sounds like, is their independence. They're very good at operating on their own. They're very good at asserting themselves. They're very good at doing these sort of things. And yes, it is causing some problems, getting in the way, but it's coming from some strengths. So how can we use these strengths to maybe help this problem? How can we um, acknowledge the strengths and say, okay, when can I tone that down? When do I need to change my approach? And so on. Another way to do this is to, instead of looking at things as quote unquote defenses, looking at it as strengths gone like too far. So an example of this is intellectualization. If you remember this defense, it's where people are really good at rationalizing and intellectualizing their problems. They're not good at um, particularly connecting with the emotions. But a strength of this is, you know, this 
might have been adaptive. Maybe they needed to rationalize and get out of their emotions. So this was a strength of theirs to develop this way of intellectualizing and rationalizing things. But now it's sort of rigid. It's the only way of coping. So their strength has turned into sort of like a rigid coping me mechanism. But acknowledging as it as a strength can be a way to highlight, like you've coped using this in the past and it's maybe a skill that you're really good at, but how can we give you new skills? So highlighting the strength and also trying to um, give them new options. They can also interpret strengths through a cultural lens. Um, so really trying to understand that person's cultural point of view and seeing how what they're doing might be helping them based on their cultural vantage point, um, what they're doing, how we can tap into the cultural context to really draw upon their strengths. So this might be, for example, if someone comes in who's fairly religious, um, really um, using that in the therapy session. So how can you um, I, work, help that person you know, who's religious use that strength of theirs, use that skill, that um, way of um, helping and them work through the world? How can you really um, play into that strength of theirs that they're bringing to the table? And there's different cultural contexts that might play a role, whether it's prayer or um, viewpoints, um, ways of coping um, from a cultural context. So there's lots of different ways that culture and strengths can sort of intersect. All right, so along with these strength-based strength interventions that any approach could use, there have been a couple um, therapy or theories that have been developed to highlight strengths, like that is the focus of their therapy. So we're going to cover two of these. So now we're in the second section of looking at specific therapies that have been developed to highlight strengths. And we're going to talk about two of them. I'll talk about Smith's Strengths-Based Counseling, or SBC, along with Wong's Strength-Centered Therapy. So we'll start with Smith's. So SBC, there's 10 stages of this theory um, of how to work um, from the strength-based counseling perspective. First, like all um, therapies, you want to create this alliance, getting to know the client, um, using empathy, unconditional positive regard, genuineness, things to really highlight and strengthen this alliance. Then you're going to specifically ask them to identify strengths, maybe strengths that they already know they have, along with um, strengths that you might see already just in this um, alliance process. Then they'll work on the problem. So they really come at it from a strength-based perspective first. So before they even go into the presenting problems, they're going to really sort of highlight strengths. and in this lens, then they can assess the presenting problems. They'll work on encouraging and instilling hope. So talking about the change process, how that will happen, what their life could look like once they work through these problems. And hope is really a cornerstone of the treatment. They'll look for solutions. So they won't focus as much on the problems, on the past. They're going to be really solution focused. So how, what's the outcome we want and how do we get there? And they'll work towards that outcome. So there's different techniques um, that are solution focused techniques that really get people working towards the solution. So some of this is behavioral, some of this is goal focused, if you remember SMART goals. So they're really going to be focused on these solutions um, and, and getting people towards, working towards these solutions. The next phase is building on these strengths and building competence. So this means looking for these external and internal assets that someone has and brings with them to help them tackle this problem that they're facing. 
maybe they have a very supportive family and they can turn to the love from their family. Um, this would be an external asset that's, that this person can rely on and use to help them overcome whatever challenge they're facing. Maybe it's an internal asset that you need to develop and work on their sense of purpose. So how do you, um, how do you get them to re-engage with the sense of purpose, find out you know, what is it they're wanting out of this situation in life and get them to really commit to that. So there's different ways and skills that people can build um, competence and strength, whether it's through these external assets, so outside of them, like family, support system, and so on, or internal assets like motivation, purpose, drive, uh, things like this. So clearly, this is a pretty empowering uh, method where they're trying to promote functioning um, for the individual. They're activating resources both within the individual and the community to really try to tackle this power um, problem. It's going to focus on change and um, changing both the meaning of events. So they'll look at okay, if this is being really interpreted negatively, what might be some other alternate explanations for this? And reframing of past ex negative experiences. So obviously these negative experiences were hurtful, harmful, um, maybe difficult, challenging, but what is a different way that they could look at it? Is it uh, an experience that taught them something? Is it something that obviously they wouldn't want to repeat, but they can learn or grow from? building resilience. So this means not just tackling this one problem, but helping them um, problem solve in the future so that they can tackle future problems and you know, be strong in the face of any challenges in the future. And in the final stage, they'll evaluate their work, really reflect back, honor the progress that they've made and do the termination sessions. All right. So the other specific um, strength-oriented psychotherapy that we'll talk about is this strength-centered therapy, or ST, by Wong. And this form of therapy um, is integrating positive psych and sort of cultural psych, so a social constructionist view of the world. And they put emphasis on how um, the world is understood through these jointly constructed meanings. So we, um, the way that we think about family, the way that we think about work, the way that we think about mental illness, the way that we think about a lot of things is based on the meaning that we give to those things. So um, work means something in this culture, which is different than work in a different culture. Family means something in this culture, which means something in different culture. So they're gonna look at the meaning that clients are giving to various parts of their life, the meaning that clients give to various uh, character strengths, and they'll pay attention to how different political, social factors, cultural factors help structure the meaning. So for an example of this, um, if we're thinking about gender, um, the world of work might look different for men and women and what the term work means. Does that include family work? Does that include parenting? And there's gender differences of the, the word work um, in at least in this culture. Um, there's different understandings of the term family. There's different understandings of the term religion. So what these um, terms mean um, to individuals are based in culture. And this also applies to these character strengths. So being assertive is relatively valued, um, for example, in men, but sometimes punished by society when women are assertive. So they're gonna pay attention to how these differences play out, even with a character strength such as assertiveness. So for this therapy, there's four phases that, um, Wong proposes a strength-centered therapist would go through. The first is called the explicitizing phase. So they're making things explicit. And by that, they're meaning they're trying to 
not just have any assumptions. So they want to identify, talk about, highlight the client's current perceived strengths and current coping skills. So they don't want to assume anything. They want to have the client talk about this. What do they perceive as their strengths, their current coping skills? They may also bring other people in to the therapy to help. So maybe in a certain culture, it would be really important to have the partner there or the family there. This doesn't mean that they're not gonna focus on what's going wrong. Obviously the client is struggling. Um, they're in therapy to probably tackle some issue or work through some challenge. So they will still honor the client's experience of the negatives, but they're gonna balance this with some of the strengths and coping skills that this person brings. The next phase is envisioning. So they're going to think about um, what do they want the outcome to be? How can they use their strengths to reach this outcome? They might visualize character strengths that they're wanting more of and use some visualization practices, some CPT to sort of work towards those goals, work towards um, you know, the things that they're going after. And they're gonna link these desired strengths to goals. So how can, if you're wanting to be more brave, um, what does that look like? How can we do that and practice those skills to sort of envision a, a better future? Empowering um, is the third phase, and this is where they're creating opportunities to use these strengths. So many role plays, they might have exercises outside of the therapy room where they can really empower the client to enact these changes and show them that they have the power to, to make some change in their life. The final phase is the evolving phase, which is sort of this continued growth, realizing that we're never really truly done with this. We always need to be growing and have things to learn. And so this is especially emphasized during termination when they're wrapping up with the client that, you know, we've overcome this obstacle, but how do you want to continue to evolve, grow? And they'll reflect back on how, um, how the client has developed what strengths they've used, what strengths they've grown, what strengths are new, and sort of use those to develop, um, to reflect on. And, and the therapist can really show the growth in the treatment process. Remember, TX stands for treatment. So just reflecting on their, uh, their evolution from the past until now and the evolution going forward. So I just wanna tell you a little bit of an example of a client that I saw, obviously I'm changing names in some situations, but I uh, wanna discuss a client that I saw. Um, they came to a counseling center that I was working at and they were pretty lonely and depressed. Um, they were fairly new at that college and were struggling. And in my work with her, I really drew upon her religious beliefs. She noted in one of the intake sessions that um, about her religion and her spirituality, um, but she wasn't connecting that necessarily to her current struggle. And so using a strength-based approach or one of these um, interventions, I really connected the dots for her. So highlighted how this seemed to be an important piece of her life and asked her how she might draw upon these beliefs to help her cope and connect with others so that she's less depressed and less lonely. So I wanted to add in a few research studies and other examples of ways that counselors use strength-based approaches. This is from one study by Sheil et al. in 2012. And they looked at ways counselors use strength-based approaches. And some themes that came out were that they amplified the client's strengths. So how they did this was to ask clients, what has helped you in the past? Um, you know, when you've encountered struggles in the past, how did you get through that? Um, this is a way to really help the client reflect on their own strengths. Um, they've done things like encouragement, so highlighting the work of the client as it had been going, comparing maybe their first session to the current session. They would take 
into account the client's context. So whether that's the cultural context, the um, family context, they're going to um, understand that clients are coming from different backgrounds and try to use these backgrounds to try to help the client move forward. They also will use the therapeutic relationship, the here and now comments. So really talking about, you know, in the moment, what are they noticing? How are they affecting the counselor? The counselor could say something like, you know, I'm really touched when you did this. I'm really moved by your um, sharing and being vulnerable in these ways. And using this here and now comment, so commenting on what's happening in the therapy room can really um, deepen sessions and help clients focus on their own strengths. A few other examples of how um, strengths might come out in therapy is sort of the words that we use. So do we say someone is a victim? Um, that implies a lot of connotations that they um, this happened to them, um, that they're helpless um, versus survivor. It also, survivor also says that they survived something, so they went through something awful, but they are in some ways resilient. They got through it. They drew upon their resources and strength and survived. So some of it's just in the language that we use. Um, and, um, another example of this is talking about post-traumatic stress. That's been researched a lot, all the negatives um, that come along with trauma. But research has begun to come out about post-traumatic growth, about ways that people can grow from trauma. Now, obviously, we don't want to create trauma in people's lives, but it's not only producing stress for people, but it can produce growth as well. Some of these growth edges might be people become more open-minded. They might become more self-aware, um, might become um, more willing to seek help. These are just some potential um, ways that um, people might cope and respond in resilient ways to trauma. So again, just sort of the language of psychology, we, can, we tend to focus on the negative, but we might want to pay attention to more of the positive. All right, as a final example of ways that counselors can use strengths and resources um, throughout the process is through the assessment. So when someone is coming in during the intake process, the counselor or therapist or psychologist asks some questions. And what's typical is that the therapist asks about, okay, what's going on? What's, what's you know the problem? What's the presenting problem? What are the risk factors? They might assess suicidal risk factors. They might assess different um, weaknesses or different potential ways that things aren't working. But it's important, this, these authors note, that it's also important to assess the strengths. So what protective factors um, does this client have? You know, what sort of connections do they have? What sort of belief systems, hope, um, what sort of resources can they really draw on to help them during this difficult time? So now in suicide assessment, for example, um, therapists are trained to not only assess for risk factors, but also assess for what's um, our client's strengths, protective factors, and so on. And in a similar vein, um, usually it's therapists are looking for, okay, what are the things that are maybe destructive in the client's environment? What are some things you know, that are not working well in the client's environment? But if we only focus on, not, on what's not working well, these deficiencies or destructive forces, we're gonna miss things that are actually going in the client's favor. So these authors also tell us that we should assess for assets or resources in the client's environment. So do they, are they connected to a church group? Are they connected to a community center? Do they have family support, friend support? Um, in what ways can we draw upon these resources um, in this person's time of need? So this is just a final way that counselors um, use strength um, approaches in all types of work. Um, and it's really trying to balance out this historical focus on the negative as I started this lecture with. So hopefully this um, lecture helps you know that um, 
therapists want to incorporate positive psychology, strength-based um, resources into counseling because it can be really helpful. And in that example I gave earlier with the client who was struggling um, with loneliness and depression, um, when I encouraged her to use some of her assets, her religion, her um, community connections there, um, she did get better and she was able to move forward. So um, this wraps up this chapter. Um, I will have more lectures for next week. Please email me if you have any questions. And thank you, and we'll talk soon.